Hello everyone, we are today here at the Panzer Museum in Munster and this is the director Ralf Ratz. Hi. And what everyone gets wrong about Panzers, so what are your, some examples from your ex long time experience here? <laughs> yeah, we pretty much know what people have um, as assumption about the tanks, how tanks work, what they do um, and how their, their magic is worked on the battlefield. And um, we are a bit happy to say that pretty much everything most people get wrong. For example, the, the biggest misconception that most people have is that the tank is the lone reigning king of the battlefield, standing alone on the battlefield, shooting in every direction, thickly armored, impenetrable, um, which is the thing that actual crew members would not believe one second. They knew best how vulnerable they were on the battlefield. And that is what we want to do here. We want to tell the story about how the tank actually worked on the battlefield. For example, he was never alone. He was never indefeatable. Um, he was as much as it was a weapon that was with full force on the battlefield, it was also a room for, for men who had fear also. And um, yeah, that's, that's one misconception people have. So basically you teach people how to do combine arms warfare? That's the, that's the tool we use for that, exactly. Kampf der verbundenen Waffen. Kampf der verbundenen Waffen. Um, the tank in the, in the concert of the instruments, like the Germans often say. Exactly. And um, as of now, we just do it with guided tours and um, we plan to remodel the museum and then the the whole, the, the main stream through the museum will be combined arms warfare through the, the century of the tank, exactly, yeah. So yeah, that's one of my slogans, combined arms warfare is good for you. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> we sell the t-shirt. Um, Excellent. Yeah, that, that's one thing. Um, another misconception, for example, um, the, the tiny parts, people, that's not a misconception. People ask actually, where do you pee when you were fighting in the tank? I actually never thought about this. But is this actually an issue? Because if the adrenaline is so high, doesn't it go away? Um, adrenaline can have a different path in your body, different, different consequences. Um, for example, I don't know if you know this, but there are many stories about paratroopers jumping out of planes, landing, wanting to get in combat, and just falling asleep. Because that's one kind of, um, I don't know the English word, the, the, the nervous system, one reaction of the nervous system to, to intense stress can be, can be falling asleep, actually. After the jump, um. it often happens. And um, so peeing is one thing. I mean, you know the, the, the cliche of the, the guy who's in his first fist fight and pees his pants. That's not so unusual. Uh, so to answer the question, um, you don't because you have too much to do. Um, sometimes you pee your pants, but that's seldom. If you really have to pee and you don't want to get out of things because you're in the, in the action, you sometimes use a, a spent shell because it's standing yeah, there. There are plenty of there. There are yeah. plenty of there. And um, never mind what you think of the movie Fury, that's one of the parts they got right, because he's doing it. I, I never saw it, I only saw the end battle on YouTube. You, 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 can, you can see, you saw, saw it, you saw it. No, <laughs> but that's one scene, he actually grabs a shell and pees into it. So ah, okay. uh, this movie answered this for a lot of people, so the, the questions get rarer. But that's one of the questions, yeah. And um, yeah, there are small conceptions we, we want to explain. For example, how blind a tank is. You don't, yeah. you don't see anything, you have small slits, even a modern with round periscopes and everything and um, thermal view and infrared and everything, you're pretty blind. And especially in the Second World War, you're sitting in a, in a steel box with small slits and everybody around you is trying to kill you. Yeah, this and is the thing. And he has better chances the nearer he comes. So, um, and the, the, the hardened warriors on the battlefield, they understood this. So the, the Panzernabekämpfer, the, the close distance tank destroyer guys, they felt safer the nearer they came. And the guys in the tanks knew that. So they were frantically looking around and, and looking, where, where are they, where are they? I saw someone, did you see what, really? Or did you imagine, no, I think it's yeah. a cluck, I heard something. And that's, that's an idea, that's an image people don't have of the tank when they come here. One reason for that being that the tanks, as you see them here, they are, they are cold, they are, they are they quiet, they are, they are empty. And uh, what we want to bring back to mind is that there, there were people in there, they were doing things and they were feeling things. And, um, it's closely connected with techniques and um, ergonomics and, and actual fighting. So it's not that we want to take out the, the techniques out of the history, as some people assumed when we started to transform the museum. We want to tell all stories and to, to make a bigger picture, to make a more complete picture. So yes. put, a, put everything in context. Correct, correct. I mean, for me, it was quite amazing to see the Panzerkampfwagen 1 the first time because yeah. everyone basically thinks, oh, that's a, that's a small paper-thin tank and yeah. there's not much you can do. And then I think about it. I look at the armor plates and everything, it's actually quite thick because yes, if I is. just have a rifle, I can't do anything, even That's, if I'm yeah, close. Yeah, good point, good point. And, but, but then you talk about an anti-tank guy who has like his magnetic mine and 
I don't know, Molotov cocktail and all the other stuff. Yeah. He's a real threat to even this tank to yeah. a certain degree, yeah. or at least to make it inoperable. And, and, and so you, you have this mixture, it really depends on the situation. Are you just an infantryman in 1939? Yeah. Then you look at the Panzer 1 and it, it's not that like, in computer games it's usually, oh, it's just a joke, boom, it explodes. But yeah, if you have just a rifle, no, it just doesn't explode. It has yeah. two machine guns and everything. And that's one important point too. When people leave our museum, I want them to take this with them. Because what we have, for, mainly for our Western visitors, maybe Germany, Europe, US, um, is kind of a technical machismo. We have the Leopard, the Abrams, the Leclerc. We have the best tanks in the world. We can shoot up everything over five kilometers. Yes, we can. And so the T-54, the 62, 70 in Syria, everything is crap. No, it isn't. It works. And if you don't have anything to counter it, one old Soviet tank, 50 years old, is still an instrument of might and power at the local point. Um, one one um, example we always use, um, for example, warlords in Congo. If you have a, a Colton mine, and if you have a garden, you have a 60-year-old T-54. It's a perfect instrument because nobody can counter it. Yeah. So we want to, uh, the people to take, yeah, not lessons, but to take t some thoughts with them and then think further when they leave. Yeah. Didn't, I mean, the perfect point to this is the Leopard 2. There were actually quite some losses, I think, yeah. recently because as far as I know, they were not used properly as well. And that's, uh, so, yeah. even the, so if you use a T-34 properly, it's probably better than a Leopard 2 if you use it improperly. I mean, it really depends that, on that, the enemy. That gap is really big, yeah, but yeah, I'm, yeah, 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 okay. in principle, it's right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Correct, yeah. So, yeah, that's, these are the stories we're telling. And um, what we want to tell also is that um, the tank is not something that just appears magically on the battlefield. It has to be designed, there are decisions to be made, and then it has to be paid for, produced, and brought to the battlefield. And all these things belong to each tank standing. It's not that we want to explain grand history like in the schoolroom, we, we develop the stories beginning from the tank. So, for example, if you're standing here at the King Tiger, you learn something about what you need to make good steel, explained at the King Tiger. So, uh, never fear that you're just walking into the classroom, um, you still get your tank history, but we want to make it so, in German it's multi-perspective, multiple perspectives. So, people want to know about the tanks even if they're not so interested in techniques, because we have the problem, um, the, the Technic fans, they come. Yeah, people people yeah, who like right, cars right. or tanks or great things, they come. Um, but oftentimes they are, they are with people who are slightly bored and understand that because not everybody is into Technics. So when we tell stories about the people who were in the tanks or fighting the tanks or designing them or something like that, we hope to get people hooked on tank history. And then maybe from there they get interested in Technics too. So you're also applying combined arms warfare to a certain degree. Com combined topics warfare, so yeah, to say. Yeah. Combined topics education, yeah. So that you put everything, you put the stories in there. Yeah, I mean, this is the, f the thing with the Angus. What I have usually, a lot of people like memoirs, and they always yeah. ask me what rem memoirs you recommend. And I usually say, I don't read me memoirs at all unless I know the topic very well because, yeah. because everything else, I just get wrong ideas into my head and put yeah. it into context. True. But some people really like the stories and the, the stuff behind. Yeah. So that you get more people into this. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's what we see as a role. We want to, to push all the, 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 the fruits of the research that everybody does to the people out there, because there are so many good books nowadays, uh, at last, um, that we want to tell the stories that are hidden in the books to the people. Quite what you do on YouTube just here at the Tank Museum, really with the tanks, because that's what we have. And as I said, seeing the things in reality is, is, is a whole other matter than you can find a million pictures of the king tiger but if you stand in front of it it's a complete different beast yeah and that goes in all i, I found it great that you took the panzer one because everybody's think of the king tiger and it's aura and it's atmosphere but every tank has, has its special aura atmosphere and then if you add stories to this comes kind of museum's magic that's yeah. what we do so you, you're also going to redesign the whole museum, I heard, True. because you, you got a large, nice fund secured. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you to the Bundestag. The, uh, the federal government sponsored us, yes, or will sponsor us. So, so what are your plans? So basically, you took all the experience and now we have all the money. So what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, we built the museum we all wanted to have. <laughs> um, Two thirds of the museum will get uh, raised down. We built completely new halls. Everything will be bright and shiny and new. Ah, excellent. Um, more important, um, I mean, we're freezing here. We get heating and uh, climatization. So it will be a steady temperature and steady um, dryness in here. And then the most important thing for me as a, as a historian is to re 
align all the, the tanks and then tell stories with them. Right now, if you walk to the museum, we have the chronology. You get from tank to tank. You see the general development. You can read science, but there's no, no greater story arc that is So no told. red line. Two. And um, there's no the story behind that. So in the new museum, we will have, at first, at the entry level, one third just technical history. Um, taking the, the classical Holy Trinity as a, as a structuring. So one part armor, one part um, firepower, one part mobility. And once you are, so to say, armed with knowledge about the techniques, you can enter the actual history. Because mm. we had the experience, people wander through the museum, even with guided tours, and sooner or later, they're standing at things. The guide is over there. What is this or this and this? Because, of course, they have questions. What are these parts? Um, so in the new museum, we get this out of the way at the beginning. People learn what they see. Um, and then they enter the chronology, starting, of course, 1916. And then they wander through 100 years of combined arms warfare. And added to this are a dozen or so in-depth areas where one topic is shown. For example, suffering, production, design, gallantry, camaraderie, stuff like that. So uh, since I, I made a lot of organization videos about panzer divisions and all that yes. stuff in the beginning, will you also cover the yes, panzer division? Yes, we will. Division? Yes, we will, of course. So there will. will be a great chart of how the panzer division looked like and uh, how it changed? Or? At, at this point, I'm going more like multimedia, more okay. medium-sized uh, monitor with changing, um, with changing um, uh, the, the diagrams. The instead one. Yes, and yes. Yeah, yeah. So maybe... We can think of Or will it do the original German <laughs> designation? Counters? Yes, yes, we will do. Really? And because I, 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 can't, I can't hardly read them. Y yes, but uh, people are here to learn, aren't they? Yeah. No, okay. we, we maybe two versions. And then maybe one idea would be um, in modern museums work, you always want to activate the people to make them yeah, do yeah, stuff. Yeah, interactivity. So yeah. maybe you could uh, make a, a touchpad and then you can design your own tank division. So what is neat. What if I add an Abteilung here? Oh, 300 persons more. How much do they eat? Oh, that's much. And so on, maybe. So ah, yeah. as I said, we are always trying to get the people to, to give the benefit of the doubt to the people who made decisions back then. So if they see how the Panzer Division changed, maybe they learn faster or are more open-minded if they can play around with it themselves. Maybe, I don't know. So, so, so since I'm a huge fan of, of quotes, as you probably know from my videos, maybe. <laughs> will, will there be some quotes like from the Heresdienstvorschrift or something also planned? Yes, that's, Excellent. I mean, uh, war tattoos, so to say, a classical thing. And uh, for example, I have um, uh, a quote from the um, Oberkommando der Wehrmacht about how the tiger is not invulnerable. Seems pretty fitting here. <laughs> Ah, yeah, yeah. You talked about this in your Tiger video. Yeah. I, I actually have a question about this. Oh, no. I, uh, Be because yeah. you always stated that, that, that a lot of people thought that the Tiger was way too strong or perceived way too strong. And, but I read also a bit and, and it was general that everyone who was not a tank guy has this. So was this, for the Tiger it was even worse. Like, because this is what, what um, Bechstein points out with the 24th Panzer Division in Stalingrad, mm. that once the panzer grenadiers were gone, they had to regular infantry supporting the tanks, and mm. the regular infantry was like, oh, a tank couldn't do everything. Yeah. So, and when I watched your, your Tiger video, I was yeah. thinking, was this just because it was a tank, or was it even worse for the Tiger? Because the infantry guys generally did, didn't have a, a cool, and, and also, as Wetschner pointed out in Sturm Artillery, that Sturmgeschütze should be organically yeah. with the infantry division so yeah. that they train together. So you mean there's, there's a general gap between the specialist who knows stuff and the layman, and the tiger being a specialist weapon, the gap is even was, bigger. Was it even bigger there, or was it generally because it was considered just a heavy tank? Like, like not that it was a tiger myth itself, but yeah. just because it was a heavy tank. At this point, I would say the latter, because the tiger myth develops in the war and then over the decades after the war. At this point, um, yeah, the, the tiger was pushed in the propaganda, but not so much as you would expect. Um, we have a media station here with um, film reels from the Wochenschau about the tiger. And I was sitting in the archive and actually with, a, with this magnet machine looking at the Wochenschau reels. And there's pretty, pretty few minutes of tiger material, actual tiger material. So um, at this point, I think you're right. It's just a damn big heavy machine with a damn big heavy gun okay. and a thick armor plate. And everybody understands this or seems to be or thinks to. So a lot of came from post-war. And I think I read in Wilbeck that he, he noted like basically 
come, comes it down to oversimplification post-war like because every allied soldier always mentioned he was attacked by a tiger and they always uh, assumed also they were shot by the 88 millimeter gun yeah. because it was the most common call, although not most common but most famous or infamous whereas usually were shot by 105 millimeter yeah. regular howitzer yeah. so it, could it be to this perception that basically everything gets down to the most famous element of you, the enemy you're just luring me into exploiting the most difficult topic we have in this myth <laughs> the tiger myth <laughs> yes of course the the tiger myth is um is so so mighty because it's built of perfectly fitting bricks everything grips into each other uh, for example the allied memory of fighting against this big beast of machine fits perfectly with the honorable losing western front tiger Uh, soldiers said, yes, we lost, but we had this magnificent... They say so. And the, the Brits say, we fought this magnificent machine because the Germans say too. So it adds up from both sides. And yes, then you have the, the problem that the people on the battlefield don't see what shells them, what hits them. So they, they search for wards and they, of course they use what they heard often, um, most often. For example, the, one aspect of the T-34 being so... Um, so Invulnerable? in the beginning perceived as yeah. invulnerable is that they were often confused with KB-1s ah, because yeah. the Germans knew the T-34 as a name it was more widespread in the, in the reports and the information from the OKV and the OKH and um, so everything they saw and couldn't identify was a T-34 to them and many KB-1s were identified as a T-34 so that explains why on the one hand they can be destroyed and on the other hand oftentimes not Actually, quite funny, I think I recently had a, I'm not sure, it was the fifth or seventh Panzer Division history, yeah. the official history, yeah. and there was a picture of, a, I think a KV-1 in there, and was written T-34 yeah, there. Even there. And, and this was post where I was like, yeah. what? Yeah. How? No. Even there. So um, you have it later with, the, with all the uh, Panzer IV upgrades who looked like Tigers yeah, in yeah. the periscope. The, I think the Soviets actually assumed that the Germans with the Schürzen on, yes, on the turret exactly, I mean, assumed exactly that they were tr and, trying to sense. make them Ex look like sense. Tigers. Again, think in dubio pro reo, benefit of the doubt for the people back then. You look under stress, through a scope, in a uh, pitching machine, on a battlefield, with a smoke, people trying to kill you. Yeah. So, over one kilometer, you see a tiny silhouette of something. And you don't, maybe you don't even know the offic official de designation, but it looks like the tiger thing everybody speaks of. Of course it's a tiger. Yeah. Like, like, like Chifton, I think, points out, it's a very emotional experience. It's a very emotional experience, and at this point, they, even if they were totally cool, maybe uh, let us think about a Sturmgeschütz in perfect ambush condition, just sitting there looking for the bait. And, but even then, The, the optics are not quite good. You, you just see, and then there's uh, the, maybe it's moving, smoke, fog, distance, bushes, dust, if debris, everything. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's a hard job, even if you're cool and have the, the time to do the job. So, yeah, and you see something, and then you, you, you grasp for words. And so the, the tiger being a name, a suggestive name, works very, very yeah. good at this point. Not as intended, but very good, yes. And in the decades after, it goes on and on. It's the same with the Hetzer. Um, the, the name was never used during war, or practically never. But it's great for memoirs yeah, and novels. So the Hetzer. And the nobody, Hetzer's going to head in English. And, and it even works now it's a pop perfectly. star. It's a, the Hetzer is a pop star. And nobody thinks about how do you call a, 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 um, um, uh, a tank that's really slow, a Hetzer, a beta. That makes no sense. It's damn slow. But it was a Jagdpanzer, a hunt tank. That's the next thing we want to... <laughs> nomenclature. The, the Panzerjäger, the tank destroyer, the Jagdpanzer, the hunting tank. These are euphemisms. These, these tanks are second-class tanks. They make their jobs wonderfully in their, in their limited field of tasks, but they are not equal to a full-range tank. Yet, they get a name that suggests that they are very effective predators, just to push up the young men. So that's, that's basically propaganda slash battlefield psychology. And that's a story to be told. I mean, it's, it's the same with the Panzergrenadiers, because it will be, as points out, quite a Panzergrenadier doesn't mean you have an armored personnel carrier, and sometimes they were just motorized guys in a truck. Yeah. But from the name, I always implied, okay, that's all mechanized infantry. No, yeah. they actually, and they put it, Gepanzert, Panzergrenadier, gepanzert, are armored in, yeah. 
in brackets in the, in the official Dienstvorschriften as well. So, so they made the clear distinction between uh, as well. Yeah. And, and nowadays you just think, oh, Panzer is yeah, they all, no, they run around sometimes in trucks. Yeah. Apart from that, the, the word grenadier for German ears, it's yeah, great. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, you can basically feel your spine stiffen. Yeah, and, 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 and grenadier. And, and, and there's also the tradition because grenadiers yes. were, were elite units originally. Yeah. They were larger guys to throw yeah. the grenades far, farther away. Indeed. So, so there's, there's the whole tradition and, and history behind this. Yeah. So now there's something else. You're going to go to demystify YouTube as well. So you're going to start yes, producing yes, videos yes. in English. Yes, we're going to do it. We're going to try it. Um, the thing is, the next years, the, the remodeling of the museum will take five years. So what we have to do now, yeah, it's, it's a big museum. Um, what we have to do now is to read stuff, much stuff. So when we read the stuff too late, come again? Um, when you're rebuilding in five yeah. years, but can you visit? In the meantime? Yes, we okay. will be open. We will cut the prices because parts will always be uh, con under Shuffle construction. Out, yeah. Yes. Um, so we, I guess we will take, let's say, three euros or so. Uh, but you can always give us more if you want to. Um, and we will tell people when we, for example, pull tanks out. So when stuff is moved, we will inform you so you can come here and see and look. And maybe we make live streams and Facebook events. I don't know. Uh, but we will stay open. And um, once it's all done, aiming at 20... Three, I guess, summer 23, um, then everything will be new and shiny, yes, indeed. And yeah, as we are reading and uh, noticing everything, um, I thought, yeah, if we read and know stuff, we can tell you stuff. So um, we will make short videos about aspects of our work, what we found out, for example, um, when do tanks start to be able to fire on the move? Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Who can name the year? I have no idea. Yes, interesting, right? So um, that's what we want to do. And that's, that's one thing that, again, is for the Panzer Museum very important. We think internationally because, yes, we are the Deutsche Panzer Museum and we, we focus on the German army, but they learn from others and they fought against others. So everything comes off from outside. And we are covering it a century. So we, can, we are not limited to the normal topic or thematic um, scopes everybody has, naturally. Um, but we, we try to, to get broader arcs. So looking, for example, how um, tank armor changed over 100 years, not during the Second World War, uh, but from uh, skeleton uh, welded plates to compound armor today in one big streak in 10 minutes on YouTube. Excellent. Hopefully. So be sure to subscribe to the channel. Yep. And big thank you here. Thank you very much. Till next time. Till next time. Bye.